The second area I want to discuss is related to cancer, which is a common indication for surgery. What has become evident is that even the most successful resection surgery of the most localized cancer with histologically clear margins will always leave minimal residual disease. This is due to micrometastases, either pre-existing or from embolization at the time of surgery. Now, whether or not these develop into clinically significant tumors depends on the balance between immune-mediated destruction of cancer cells and the tendency of these cells to proliferate and establish a blood supply. It's increasingly recognized that as anesthesiologists, we can potentially influence this process with our perioperative management of cancer patients undergoing surgery. And this gives us a very important role in determining their long-term outcome. This has led to the emergence of onchoanesthesia, and a good overview of this subject is provided by another free-to-access article in the 2021 Anesthesia Supplement. The authors nicely summarize the mechanistic basis for onchoanesthesia and describe the contribution that regional anesthesia can make to outcomes. This figure from the article summarizes the various mechanisms for the pro-metastatic effect of surgery and illustrate where regional anesthesia can have an effect. This includes attenuation of the surgical stress response, inflammation, and acute pain. Regional anesthesia also allows us to minimize the use of opioids and volatile anesthetics, which have been shown in preclinical studies to promote tumor cell growth. Unfortunately, the evidence from clinical trials does not clearly show a definite benefit from incorporating regional anesthesia as yet. And this is probably because prognosis in cancer is dependent upon so many other factors. However, there is as yet absolutely no evidence that the use of local anesthetics or regional anesthesia has a negative impact. So there's a lot of potential upside with no real downside. We should also not overlook the fact that neuraxial blockade has been shown to contribute to enhanced recovery, particularly in thoracic and abdominal surgery. This contributes to improved outcome by allowing patients to engage in adjuvant therapy earlier and placing them in a better physical condition to tolerate the rigors of treatment. If we want to provide regional anesthesia for thoracic and abdominal surgery, the traditional method has been to perform a thoracic epidural. In regional anesthesia circles, however, a currently popular debate is whether thoracic epidurals have been superseded by fascial plane blocks. Injection into the muscular wall of the chest or abdomen seems like it should be preferable to putting a needle into the spine. But the answer is not clear cut, which is why these debates continue to be featured in various conferences. I don't have the time to delve into the pros and cons of both here, but I will say that I am very much a supporter of thoracic epidurals in the right context. There are clearly proven benefits to patients. A working epidural is the gold standard for analgesic efficacy in terms of both reducing the intensity of pain as well as opiate consumption. You get bilateral, somatic and visceral analgesia that can be accurately targeted to the surgical area. Opiate sparing minimizes the risk of adverse effects, notably nausea and vomiting and intestinal ileus, which accelerates recovery. There is good animal and preclinical evidence for improved splanchnic perfusion and gut microcirculation, so much so that our ICU colleagues are investigating thoracic epidurals to treat acute pancreatitis. Having said that, the evidence for overall postoperative mortality, at least in abdominal surgery, is less clear. But once again, the question is only whether there is a benefit or not. It does not increase mortality. And in fact, it reduces the risk of major morbidity, particularly from respiratory complications and cardiac arrhythmias. It also isn't as dangerous as we believe. Here are th three large database studies of thoracic epidurals looking specifically at associated complications. All came from European teaching hospitals with a high volume of epidurals, but where trainees as well as consultants performed the blocks. Only one case of permanent neurological deficits was reported, and this was a dysesthesia in the inguinal region that was of unclear etiology. Pooling the numbers gives us an incidence of just 7 per 100,000. The risk of transient deficits is somewhat higher, 2.4 per thousand, but these were all sensory in nature and resolved within several days. Epidural hematoma in the elective setting is much less common in thoracic than lumbar epidurals, and only one case was reported out of these three studies, again giving us a pooled incidence of 7 per 100,000. 
Epidural abscess is another rare complication. In all cases that were reported, were associated with catheters kept in place for five days or longer. The incidence of accidental dural puncture in one of the studies was 7 in 1,000, which sounds high, but is lower than with lumbar epidurals. Notably, none of these patients had neurological deficits or post dural puncture headache. Perhaps the most common objection to thoracic epidurals, however, is that it causes hypotension. However, I'd say that this is a question perhaps of mindset, education, and appropriate management. Even in critically ill patients, the observed incidence of hypotension with thoracic epidurals is only 8%, and all of them respond readily to a fluid bolus with or without some vasopressors. Finally, does analgesia come at the cost of impaired mobilization? Lower limb weakness is rare with thoracic epidurals, particularly if appropriately low concentrations of local anesthetic infusions are used. Thoracic epidurals have also gained a reputation as a challenging technique with a high failure rate. This 2016 article suggests that at least in training centers, the primary failure rate, that is the failure to place the catheter in the epidural space, can be as high as 20 to 24%. However, I think we might be exaggerating this somewhat. Remember that thoracic epidurals provide bilateral coverage with a single puncture and a single catheter, unlike abdominal wall blocks. So it's actually less complex perhaps than inserting and maintaining multiple fascial plane catheters. And if you have proper technique, a good understanding of vertebral anatomy and have been trained well, it can be successful 99% of the time. I do recognize however, that there is a vicious circle of declining popularity and in inadequate opportunities to practice and learn the technique. But speaking as somebody who now only occasionally inserts thoracic epidurals, there are other strategies that we can use to improve success, including the use of ultrasound imaging and confirming epidural catheter placement with epidural stimulation or waveform analysis. I describe ultrasound imaging of the thoracic spine in a separate YouTube video, but very briefly, ultrasound lets us visualize the flat plate-like thoracic laminae as almost horizontal hyperechoic lines. And the gaps between these flat hyperechoic lines is the interlaminar space. Hyperechoic elements within the interlaminar space or gap represent the bony lip of the lamina or the ligamentum flavum. Ultrasound therefore tells you where the thoracic interlaminar spaces are, how deep they are from the skin, and where the midline is. This information marked on the patient's skin lets you more accurately triangulate your needle insertion. In patients with scoliosis or degenerative disease, you can also determine if one or more, left or right, of the paramedian spaces are more open than the other. Regardless of whether you use ultrasound or not, it is important to adopt a, an appropriate insertion point and trajectory. To me, this means staying medial and close to the midline, just alongside the spinous processes, and keeping the lateral to medial angle small. Keeping to one small and constant lateral medial angle limits your redirections to just one plane, cranial and caudal. This reduces error and increase, increases the chance of success. I therefore greatly prefer to call this a paraspinous approach and not a paramedian approach. And I believe this is what is actually happening when we perform a so-called midline thoracic epidural. Needle entry is usually readily confirmed by feel of the ligamentum flavum and the usual loss of resistance of saline or air, which all of us acquire with training in the labor and delivery suite. Loss of resistance can sometimes be unreliable though. This has led to the development of methods to confirm that the catheter tip is actually lying within the epidural space. The two methods with proven benefit are epidural stimulation and waveform analysis. Epidural waveform analysis re requires only a pressure transducer kit and a length of sterile tubing to connect it to the hub of the needle, essentially an arterial line kit. This makes it accessible to almost everyone. The presence of a pulsatile waveform indicates that the needle or catheter tip lies within the epidural space. And in one randomized controlled trial of thoracic epidurals performed by residents, the use of waveform analysis significantly reduced epidural failure rate. Note that they use a very strict definition of success, which makes the results all the more remarkable. 
time to complete the block was slightly longer in the waveform analysis group, but it's worth noting that the results led to re-attempted insertion in 40% of the group. Although we don't know if all of these would have been failures, it probably did contribute to the overall success rate in that group. Epidural stimulation using a specialized epidural kit has also been described. A special adapter may be used with a saline-primed regular epidural catheter to conduct current. An epidural stimulation is particularly useful for ensuring that the tip is placed at a desired segmental level. Essentially, a motor response in the truncal muscles is observed at a current threshold of between 1 to 10 milliamps if the tip lies within the epidural space. And anything outside these limits suggests that the catheter may be lying somewhere else. The utility of epidural stimulation was highlighted in a recent editorial, but one obstacle remains the need for specialized equipment. As most epidural catheters are not designed to conduct current without the special adapter, and so one solution used in some centers is to use a stimulating peripheral nerve catheter as the epidural catheter instead.